and the overlying solid mantle, the main objective being to understand the, the thermal and chemical conditions that have enabled Earth to sustain a magnetic field over most of its history. And this, this sort of approach has, has really been reinvigorated by the uh, results coming out of the mineral physics community concerning the uh, value of the thermal conductivity of liquid iron mixtures at very high temperatures and pressures. And so this issue of core conductivity that has been brought up a couple of times already will, will feature quite heavily in this talk. So I thought I'd start by showing the, the uh, pint database with the VADM or VDM values and the function of age, where I've done really nothing to take to filter this database. I've just taken what uh, Andy kind of provided. And really to, to say that, of course, we would love to produce a theoretical model that could capture the, uh, the sort of absolute values and potential long-term trends that are in, in this wealth of information and also the variability. But what I'm going to be focusing on is a rather um, simpler question, which is how did the core manage to generate the field for such a long period of time? The field evidently existed back to three and a half billion years, it might have even uh, been longer, and this record doesn't seem to strongly suggest that there are any uh, long-term gaps or holes in the record where the field might have switched off and subsequently come back on. So I guess our, our, our simple task, or complicated task, is to explain how the dynamo operated over this period. And of course, as, we, as we're all well aware, this is a sort of cartoon, but, but the, the field's being generated in a, in a liquid core by convective motions, and the kinetic energy associated with these motions is being converted to magnetic energy in the dynamo process. But what I'm interested in is how do we power the motions in the first place? How do we keep the core convecting and generating the magnetic field? And what we're going to do is really adopt the standard model for powering the dynamo where the convection arises due to cooling of the planet as a whole and specifically cooling of the core by the overlying mantle as mantle convection extracts a certain amount of heat, QCMB, from the core. And conservation of energy relates the CMB heat flow to the various, uh, to various terms and various processes going on inside the core, two of which are related to the growth rate of the inner core. And this on the <coughs> left-hand side is just an, an illustration of one plausible uh, growth history for the inner core, where I'm plotting temperature versus radius. And it's also illustrating how the calculation of the inner core growth rate is actually achieved by comparing the, the intersection of the melting curve, which is shown in the, uh, the black dash, to the ambient temperature profile. So in this particular instance, at one billion years ago, the blue line, the ambient temperature is everywhere above the melting curve. The, the core was entirely molten. As the core cooled, the first intersection with the melting curve is at the Earth's center, in this case about half a billion years ago, and the inner core grows to its present size uh, in that time. So the two, uh, the two terms that depend on the inner core growth rate are the latent heat QL, so this is the heat that is released as the solid freezes out of the liquid mixture, and then QC is the gravitational energy that is arising as light elements are selectively rejected from the solid phase on freezing and are mixed uniformly back into the core, the liquid core. There are two other terms that don't depend on the presence of an inner core, the secular cooling QL, so this is just the, the stored heat, and the radiogenic heat in QR that might arise from the presence of any radiogenic elements in the core. And the first three guys, the, the secular cooling, the latent heat, and the gravitational energy, are all related to the cooling rate of the core. And we, you know, many studies have found that it is the latent heat and the gravitational energy that are being released during inner core growth that are providing most of the power or the entropy, if you like, to sustain the present day magnetic field and the geodynamo. So inner core nucleation, as we've heard before today, is quite an important 
uh, point in Earth's history and something that we would like to be able to uh, estimate accurately. So one way of going about this, as we've already heard, is that we might expect in a core nucleation to have some signature in the paleomagnetic record. It seems plausible that we might expect a change in the field strength as the inner core nucleated. But as, we've, as we have already heard, um, there are, it, is, it is a difficult task to pull these long-term trends out of the available data that we have. And I'm not going to, to lay the, that particular point. I'm going to identify two other issues. One is that there is this sort of uh, gap or few data, I guess, that Nick pointed out earlier. In uh, a period of time where, as you're going to see, the models I'm going to show you are going to predict the inner core nucleation. So this is the sort of time when theoretical models would say that, we, that the inner core would have nucleated and the time where we don't seem to have an awful lot of uh, data to constrain it. The thing that's worth pointing out, and I'll, uh, the final thing that's worth pointing out that I'll come on to, is that the, the, the theoretical models of the, the gross energetics of the core do not directly relate inner core growth rate to field strength. They, they give us something called the ohmic dissipation of, that I'll define more exactly later. It is another step to go on and find <clears throat> the field strength. We just have to be a little bit careful in what we're talking about when we're uh, making these sorts of, of models. So an, an alternative route perhaps to estimate the inner core age would be is if we had a fantastic constraint on the core mantle boundary heat flow. If we knew the core mantle boundary heat flow over time to a, a high degree of accuracy, we could take the energy equation that gives us the cooling rate if we just know some terms that depend on the material properties of, of the core. And we could then back out the inner core age. The problem is that we don't know the CMB heat flow particularly well, even at the present day. This is the, the total energy budget for the entire Earth that has been uh, sort of uh, analyzed in detail in the recent Treats in Geophysics article. And you can sort of see that there are various uncertainties on the, 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 where, where, the heat, where the heat is contained in the different reservoirs, in particular in the secular cooling of the mantle and the heat coming out of the core. So we don't know the, the CMB heat flow particularly well today, and we know it, our, our knowledge degrades as we go into the past. So really the, the CMB heat flow is something that needs to be uh, predicted as part of a model, as well as... Um, the properties of the dynamo. So we sort of need a more, uh, if we're going to take this sort of theoretical approach, we need a more sophisticated model. And it turns out that one of the things the model depends quite strongly on is the thermal conductivity. What you're looking at is temperature versus pressure, and the convic thermal conductivity is in the top. The temperature's there because the conductivities have been calculated at various points on these adiabatic temperature profiles. And I guess the point is here that up until about 2012, we were mostly using these values shown in the, in the blue and the, the green that were really extrapolated from lower pressure temperature conditions. And they gave us values of the thermal conductivity of about 40 watts per meter per Kelvin at the core mantle boundary with not a, a huge increase across the core going from the core mantle boundary to the inner core boundary over here. So the then density functional theory calculations were performed by a number of groups. So these are sort of theoretical quantum mechanical based calculations that were actually performed at the <coughs> required pressure temperature conditions. And these sort of revealed a quite significant increase in the thermal conductivity compared to these older estimates. The, the pure iron results are up here in the darker colors and give us enormous thermal conductivities at the, at the core mantle boundary, 150 watts per meter per Kelvin. But of course the core is not a pure, it's not composed of pure iron, so for various um, different iron mixtures, usually some combination of iron, oxygen and silicon, we get something that's about more like 100 watts per meter per Kelvin at the core mantle boundary, rising by up to 150, I guess, at the, at the inner core boundary. And it's worth pointing out that, as, as John mentioned earlier, there is still a lot, quite a bit of debate about these calculations. In particular, the, the new experimental results have been extrapolated to the core, so they're still not done at the, the correct conditions, but the DFT calculations suffer from not 
adequately modeling the electron-electron correlations. So there is still a lot of work that is, is to be done in this area, but certainly for, from our point of view, we've been interested in trying to construct thermal histories for the Earth that, uh, in, that employ these high conductivity values because these are much uh, more poorly understood. So the easiest way to, I, the way I'm going to describe the calculations we've been doing to you is by uh, is first focusing on the evolution of the core and assuming that we have some way of prescribing the CMB heat flow or otherwise knowing it so that we can, uh, for the moment, not worry about what the mantle is doing and focus on the core. So I've already shown you the energy balance which relates the CMB heat flow to the cooling rate. There's a number in front A that in principle we can calculate if we know the material properties of the core. The radiogenic heating, if indeed there is any, does not depend on the cooling rate. So if you uh, want to just put some potassium 40 in the core and keep the CMB heat flow the same, you can have a lower cooling rate. That's, uh, that's an option that's available to you. The problem is that this equation doesn't tell us anything about the dynamo process because magnetic energy is dissipated internally inside the core. So we need to look at the entropy balance to uncover the dissipative terms, the entropy production terms that tell us about the magnetic field. And so that's what I've written here, again, in, in this sort of symbolic notation, um, because that's all we really, really need. On, on the right-hand side, there are these four terms. These are, these are entropy terms that are all related to the energy sources. They're essentially giving the thermodynamic efficiency of the various energy sources. And three of them are related to the cooling rate, the, the, the radiogenic terms not. The real uh, stuff is going on on the left-hand side. The EB is the barrier diffusion. This is not a particularly important term. EA is the entropy due to thermal conduction. It depends on the core conductivity. Increase the conductivity, you increase this term. The one that we're really after is this guy, EJ, the ohmic dissipation. It represents the entropy produced by electric currents that are associated with the dynamo process. This is the term that tells us about the dynamo that was produced in a gross sense. So the point of, of putting this up is to show you that we have a, a prescription to go from the CMB heat flow to the magnetic field. We, for a given CMB heat flow, we can extract a cooling rate from the top equation, pop it into the bottom one, and we can get the ohmic heating out. That's, that's a, a, a prescription that has been used an awful lot over many years. It's worth highlighting that this guy, EJ, is not a particularly simple term. The magnetic field B enters into here in this quite complicated fashion. So we are not estimating the field strength. This is an integrated quantity. So we, if we were to estimate it directly, we would need to know all the components of the magnetic field everywhere in the core. So it's not straightforward to go. You, you need an, there needs to be an extra step if we are to go from this term which is predicted by this theory to the field strength. And I'm, I'm not going to make that extra step. That requires a bunch of different um, analyses that are, are still very much under construction. The, 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 I guess what, what you can see is that if you increase the thermal conductivity, you move this guy over to the right-hand side, then you've got to have a higher cooling rate to maintain the same dynamo by which I mean to get the same EJ. So you increase the conductivity, you need a higher cooling rate. If you've got a higher cooling rate, you've got a younger inner core, the core temperature will be hotter in the past. This is the simple prediction that we would make. And this is a fairly complicated plot that bears out those particular um, suppositions. So I'll just spend a little bit of time on this. It's a phase, sort of a phase plot, if you like. The predicted inner core age is on the x-axis. And this is the core temperature three and a half billion years ago, because at the time this was the earliest paleomagnetic measurement. So we chose that time. The different symbol shapes are these. Are, these were chosen to sort of give, give some indication of the uncertainty in these calculations. They're different values of the inner core boundary density jump. This is what's essentially setting the core composition. So uh, I'll come on to it more a bit later. But they're supposed to show the, the uncertainty in, in a way. And there are various other people's work on here, these, these guys that are here. And my, my results are in blue, green, and red. And what I did to get these results is that I tried to create a conservative evolution for the core where I set the ohmic dissipation to be zero before in a core formation. What this does 
is gives you the slowest cooling core. I can't make the core cool any slower in this formulation, which means I get the oldest in the core that I can get. If I, if I, if I set EJ to be something higher, I get a, a younger inner core. So that was the idea. So let's go through it. When you've got the, the, these conductivities over here, thermal conductivity is what are being used in the literature by sort of Stacey and Anderson, Stacey and Loper. And what happens is when you put these through your thermal history model, you get quite an old inner core. You can quite happily live with something that was a billion years old, two billion years old. And the core doesn't heat up very much. The core temperature at the moment is probably 4,000 Kelvin at the top. It hasn't changed very much over time, according to these models. The numbers inside each of the symbols are the heat flow, the CMB heat flow, three and a half billion years ago. So this is telling you that the heat flow remains pretty low for the whole of time. You don't need an, awf an awfully big heat flow to sustain the dynamo. Now you come over to here with the high conductivities, and I can just get rid of some of those labels to make it easier see and it's pretty clear that what you've done is in order to sustain the same dynamo you need a younger inner core 300 to 600 million years old and the core had to be very hot at early times of course the cooling rates high so you needed to start at a high temperature and cool it down to something sensible that we see today and you need needed high heat flows to do it. Some of these models are predicting 40 something terawatts, which is basically what's coming out of the surface of the earth at the present day. So these high conductivities had a huge impact on our interpretation of the thermal history of the core and raised the question to many people as to whether this is an acceptable situation. Is it okay to have these enormous heat flows at early times? Is it okay to have these enormous temperatures at early times? We don't know because we haven't invoked the mantle yet. The mantle is just something we're putting off till later. But, you know, people quite reasonably said, maybe this is not okay. And, we, and we're actually our formulation is missing an ingredient. So the objective here, just before I describe it, is to compare the dash lines and the, uh, the solid lines. And what O'Rourke and Stevenson essentially said is that we are missing an ingredient from our model, and that ingredient is X solution. If the, if the core managed to form under incredibly high temperatures, then magnesium can, in principle, partition, uh, dissolve into liquid iron and fall with it into the core. If, that's, if that is possible and you can cool the core pretty rapidly after it forms, you can get the magnesium in principle to precipitate out, leaving behind a dense fluid that is depleted in magnesium rich in iron that will then sink and mix the core. So it's, all, it's almost analogous to compositional convection with an inner core, if you like. But it's happening at the top and it's happening for all time. So it's perfect. It solves every single problem going because the CMB temperature doesn't change very much. This is time, core mantle boundary temperature stays almost flat over the whole period of time. The inner core can be pretty old, one, two billion years, just like it was in the before time. And the CMB heat flow never needs to be particularly large. It can stay almost constant, which is, which is great. Um, so that's sort of where, that's my attempt to summarize how things have, have gone. What we said is that, so, so when you just consider the core now, and you, and you invoke these high conduct, core conductivities that have come out of the mineral physics community, you find that your thermal history for the core predicts that the inner core is young and the core started off hot and you needed a lot of heat to maintain the dynamo. And so X solution and, and such things were proposed as a possible resolution. What we, in a sense, we didn't want to throw away the, uh, if you like, classical model that seems to have worked fine for the last 50 years quite, you know, just yet, and we thought, well, can we try and produce a self-consistent evolution for the mantle and the core without things like X solution? So what we're going to try and do is take the model of, of the core that I've just described and couple it to a model of the evolution of the mantle. And put these models together will tell us, they, they will give us a bunch of, of constraints. So the core model, as we've seen, tells us about the dynamo and tells us about whether the dynamo is operating, we want it to, to be compatible with the observations. It'll give us the, the, the uh, 
the size of the inner core at the present day that we know very well from seismology, and it'll give us the temperature, which we've got constraints on. The mantle will give the mantle model will give us the heat coming out of the top of the mantle and the mantle temperature. So we've got a bunch of constraints we can apply to these models, and if we can find models that the solutions that match the constraints, we can start looking at what these models might predict. So some details on on the model for those of you that are interested. I've described the, I've described, and also just to show how, how a basic calculation might go. This is the, the core model, I've described most of it. I've described the basic equations which are put down here. The real objective is of course to calculate A and B, these terms that are relating the cooling rate to the inputs and the outputs. To do this, we model the core as a well-mixed and composition uniform uh, fluid. So in, under those circumstances, the temperature follows an adiabat, and we have a, a bunch of other uh, little bells and whistles that are sort of trying to make it as, as realistic as possible in inverted commas. This is how we, we would go about a single calculation. We start with the inner core boundary density jump. This is density versus radius from the, the PREM model. The inner core boundary density jump is shown here, and it's, it has an uncertainty of about, I guess, 25% 20, from the, this normal mode study of Masters and Gubbins. And so for each density jump, we use the model of Dario Alfie and co-workers that attempts to match this density jump and the total mass of the core to a given core composition. So he uses oxygen and silicon as his lighter elements. And for a given density jump, we can, he, he gives us the oxygen and silicon concentrations that will match that density jump while preserving the mass of the core. As we increase the amount of light impurity, the temperature at the inner core boundary that effectively anchors the temperature across the core changes. Of course, it gets depressed because the melting point is getting depressed. So once we have a composition, we can calculate temperature profiles, adiabats, that are anchored at the inner core boundary and then extrapolated down to the core. And once we have the adiabats, we can calculate the material properties like the thermal conductivity at the points on the adiabats. So this is how a sort of calculation would go. And this is why the, the density jump is in some sense embodying the uncertainty in the calculation. The mantle model is, a, again, it's a, this is Peter Driscoll's model. It's a 1D parameterized model. All these models are parameterized because we're looking for these incredibly long time variations, right? We're not solving the detailed fluid dynamics we would need computers we don't currently have. So in this parameterization, the viscosity of the mantle depends on temperature. Um, R is the gas constant here. It's a simple sort of Arrhenian law where A is the activation energy and mu naught is the reference viscosity. These are both varied within, a number, within reasonable bounds. We also vary the ratio of the upper and lower mantle viscosity. And the reason we're doing that is because they enter into the parameterizations for the fluxes. We need to know the flux coming out of the convecting mantle, Q comb, and the flux coming out of the core mantle battery. And to do this, we use a sort of standard scaling analysis that relates the Nusselt number, which is telling us about the, the heat flux being uh, due to the convection, and the Ray number, which is telling us about the temperature difference across the system, how, how hard we're driving the system. And so this sort of scaling law comes when it's, it's the boundary layers, at the, top, the thermal boundary layers that are determining the heat transfer in the system. We also consider the uh, vary the amount of radiogenic heating for this thing called the, the Urey ratio that again we vary within the bands that have been suggested in, in recent reviews and we get a bunch of models and where we've tried to vary a whole bunch of the parameters to obtain successful models and again this is, so this is one of the the sort of interim results where you're looking at a phase plot of inner core radius. This is the predicted inner core radius at the present day. And here I have plotted the ohmic dissipation at inner core nucleation. This is the, this is the time when the ohmic dissipation is its lowest. Um, and the point, I guess, you, you know, you, for you, if you're interested, you can see which parameters we've varied and what symbols they correspond to. The point of showing this slide is to show that actually it's very difficult to find successful models. We tend to find models that group into two different categories. Models that, where the magnetic field is predicted to be active for the whole of time, but the inner core is much too big, 
or models where the unit where the magnetic field dies prior to inner core nucleation, but we get a reasonable inner core size. And the reason for this is essentially that the mantle in this particular setup is cooling the core too quickly. So this is a particular example of the second scenario. What happens is the focus is on the black line, the entropy. The, magnet, the mantle is cooling the core too quickly. The inner core doesn't actually form. The ohmic dissipation goes negative, which is basically telling us our model assumptions are not valid anymore. And then the inner core comes in to save the day at some point it's too late, where it's too late to save the day. So we got into this problem where we used a whole bunch of reasonable parameters in a model that had been, as, where the basic model had been used an awful lot and didn't get any successful results, which told us that actually it must be quite hard to get a sensible thermal history uh, with a high conductivity. So we asked ourselves, what could we do? And so we thought, well, one of the things we were trying to avoid was this thing I've alluded to of putting radiogenic elements into the core, because this is a very contentious thing to do. People don't like an awful lot of radiogenic elements in the core because they're not thought to partition into it during core formation. But we said, ah, let's just put them in. And, and of course, we managed to find a successful model. So this was an example of a successful model. The ohmic dissipation here, this is telling us about the magnetic field, the black line, it's, it's positive for the whole of time, excellent. The inner core, through to its present uh, radius, this is the blue, in the, in the second plot, grows to its present radius in about 300 million years. It's young, just like we, we sort of knew it would be. Um, the temperature of the core comes down to about 4,000 Kelvin at the top of the core, which is a perfectly reasonable number. And we need quite a high CMB heat flow over time. It drops down to about 15 terawatts now. It was about 45 terawatts a long time ago. This is, this is sort of what we were expecting. The, the catch, the snag, is just that this model corresponds to about 2.5 terawatts of potassium-40 in the core at the present day. This is, by most people's estimates, unsatisfactory. So, um, We'd realized that this problem was, was difficult. Um, but we also realized that, of course, there are loads of, there are lots of possible reasons why this, why our model has, has been unsuccessful. It's most likely, there, there are possible issues to do with the parameterizations of the mantle that reflect our incomplete knowledge of mantle convection, fine. But we took a different route, which is to say, all of our models predict the core was very, very hot at early times hotter than most estimates for the lower mantle solidus. This is suggesting that at some point in the past, the lower mantle was molten. And so we thought we haven't really actually accounted for this. Our model is not yet self-consistent. And so that's what we started working on recently. And we took, so we sort of now add in a little layer here where the lower mantle is allowed to remain molten for some period of time dictated by the, the dynamics. And we followed this particular um, Peter at least has followed this particular study by Stefan Lebros, where the, the uh, parameterization for this intermediate molten layer is very simple. It, uh, we have a linear uh, temperature profile, adiabat, and a linear liquidus. So this thing, the liquidus is, um, is shallower than the adiabat, so this thing will freeze downwards as the, as the mantle cools. And there are some very simple parameterizations in it that are in all likelihood, much too simple to actually describe the evolution of such a layer. But what it does is essentially do the same thing as radiogenic heating in the core. It flattens out the CMB heat flow by sort of because of the latent heat QL that gets released inside this layer. So what we found, our preliminary results give us very, very similar results to our model with core radiogenic heating, only we didn't have to put any radiogenic heating into the core. We got in a core, we have an inner core age from this sort of model of around about 300 million years, present day CMB heat flow 13 terawatts, which is perfectly reasonable. We didn't have to invoke core radiogenic heating. Tomorrow, Dave Stegman will give you a much more complete description of a magma ocean a basal magma ocean. This at the moment is too simple, but we're sort of working to make it a bit better. So the conclusions are core evolution models where we consider the core in isolation 
and we use a high thermal conductivity that has been proposed by recent mineral physics studies, give us an inner core age of 300 to 600 million years. Our coupled models where we, where we try and model the, the mantle and mantle dynamics in a parameterized manner, give us some, an estimate at the lower end of this range. The inner core is young and with high conductivity, it seems hard to avoid. Thank you. Questions? Sabina. Um, two quick questions or comments. Uh, with the higher thermal conductivity estimates, you also end up with higher electrical yeah. And when you're looking at the entropy that you've got the entropy the thermal conductivity and then you've also got the dynamo term. And dynamo term has electrical conductivity. No, because I haven't, I haven't, um, I, I, I haven't, dis I haven't claimed that I have a way of estimating the field strength on the length scale from the ohmic dissipation. I know that, I know that I've got a total ohmic dissipation, but I haven't said that that ohmic dissipation can be estimated as B squared over some length that I suppose I know, because I know I don't know it, and it's, you know, it's a hard thing to actually estimate and most of our scaling laws from dynamo models do not get that length scale correct so i haven't it's also not necessarily true that the electrical conductivity goes up with the thermal conductivity it does in dario Alfie's models because he finds that the lorenz number is 2.43 times 10 to the minus 8 which is what it should be but other people, you know, uh, like the Canoptiva study says that, well, really the Wiedemann and Franz law doesn't hold because they sort of claim that they have to change the Lorenz number, which seems akin to saying the Wiedemann and Franz law doesn't hold. So I think that's not, that's not resolved. In, in Dario's studies, it's resolved because he calculates the Lorenz number, but also he doesn't account for the electron-electron correlations. And the, the group in Sweden that are doing these dynamical mean field theory calculations that do account for the electron electron correlations, find that in a solid, in, in solid pure iron at inner core boundary conditions, <laughs> the Wiedemann and Franz law does not hold. Okay, in the interest of getting to a glass of wine or beer, we <laughs> could move to uh, the um, cell magazine with the gap pills, rocks, and zircons once more. <laughs> Start on the light. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get you. So, all right. This is How do I get out? <laughs> Run. Well, I walked up to it and it opened. That's for me. Um, so uh, thanks very much to the to organizers for inviting me to this. I know this is like a lot of work to organize this, and you guys do it many years now and I really appreciate uh, you giving me the chance to talk. So today I'm going to talk to you about this uncontroversial topic you heard about this morning. Um, you know, we're doing uh,